Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. I believe before you leave today, I believe before you sign off this morning, you can be changed by the mercy of God. Because I'm living proof of what the mercy of God can do. And we'll get into that story in just a few minutes. First, I want to thank each and every one of you who came to the hospital while I was there for those six days. You came and visited me, encouraged me. Someone says it makes no sense that you're healing so quickly. Well, it does, if you understand the power of the blood. It does, if you understand the power of prayer. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Thanks to all those that came to the house to see us after I went home, who brought food, all the calls, all the texts. And I need to apologize because for about seven days, I didn't want to see that cell phone. And so Yvonne was left to try to handle hers and mine, and hers was blowing up the whole time because of your love. And because of those of you around the world who love us. So if I didn't get to return your call or your text, I'm sorry. Catch me after service and we can talk it out. Amen? And I want to thank all those who stepped up here at the church to lift the mantle of leadership and cause things to move forward. The board did a wonderful job. Those of you who stepped up to speak, to preach, to teach, thank you so very, very much. I greatly appreciate it. And it shows me this is a mature church. This church is filled with believers who understand the mandate of ministry. That encourages me. And last and most importantly, would you stand, Yvonne? I've got to thank my wife, who's been a rock. I love you, babe. You can sit down. Unbelievable the way she has stood beside me and cared for me. The notes for this message are on the app. You can go there if you choose to follow along, or you can just listen and look up the notes later. For about two months now, two and a half months, we have been in Acts chapter 2, talking about this is that, which was Peter's response to the criticism, the scoffing, the doubt, the unbelief of the Jews in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when they heard the 120 speaking in their own languages, declaring the wonderful works of God. Peter stood then and said, these are not drunk as you suppose, it's only the ninth hour, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he began to quote Joel chapter 2. And as we walked through this message and talked about what that means, and it is a message, not one message, God has been so present and so real and done so many mighty things in this house. And I want to tell you, if you're looking for a place where the Spirit of God is here all the time, you found it. If you're tired of church as usual, come visit us. If you don't want any more dead religion, come and find the living Christ that will transform your life. And as I was a month ago, over a month ago, preparing this message to preach on October the 30th, I read through the entire book of Acts, and not one time is the word mercy or God's mercy referenced in the book of Acts. But when you read every chapter, it's written plainly upon the lives of those that God touched. His mercy, it's there. And I wrote this note in my sermon notes, would you rather read about God's mercy or would you rather experience it? We'll talk more about that in a minute. But what we need to understand is when God begins to move among a group of people, mercy is always poured out. First on his people to bring forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, encouragement. And then on the lost, the sick, the bound to bring healing, forgiveness. And as his people begin to share his wonderful works, mighty and wonderful things begin to occur. 
Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, well, verse 15 and 16, for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted in all manner like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, and I love that conjunction, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy or obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Isn't it interesting that in that verse it clearly shows us mercy is the gateway to grace. And it's interesting that God's mercy keeps us until God's grace finds us. That's a powerful thought. You need to consider it, contemplate on it, and then apply it in your life. God mercy, God's mercy has kept me until His grace found me. And it transformed and changed my life. You know, to really have the understanding and background of God's mercy and what it means to us and what it meant in the Old Testament, we have to go back and look at how the Ark of the Covenant was constructed by Moses under the instruction of God. You know that in the Ark of the Covenant, there were three things. It was Aaron's budding rod, a jar of manna, and the stone tablets with the commandments written on them. And the Ark of the Covenant represented and was, in fact, the presence of God for the Hebrews. On the top of that ark was a flat seat made of solid gold. And that was the mercy seat. And once a year, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of a spotless lamb. He would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. And there, justice met mercy. And there, God showed mercy to a sinful nation who often did not follow him. Today, we don't stand before the Ark of the Covenant. We stand before the cross because that is our mercy seat. It was on the cross that justice met mercy and forgiveness was granted to anyone who would choose to ask. It was on the cross that a, sin, a sinless, holy God met sinful man and brought change into his life. Romans 5.8 says it this way. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Excuse me. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have brought, been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's all talking about mercy. Talking about the way we are connected to God in spite of what we bring. He shows us mercy and that mercy leads to grace and that grace leads to forgiveness. And forgiveness leads to transformation. And transformation leads to being a mature person in the body of Christ. So I started thinking about the mercy of God, did some research and studying. The mercy of God is mentioned 261 times in the scripture. 41 books of the Bible reference the mercy of God. It's a very, very important foundational truth for any believer to understand. And then I went to Psalm 136, and I begin reading Psalm 136, and it says in verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Verse 2, oh, give thanks to the God of gods. His mercy endures forever. It goes on through that passage, and 26 times in Psalms 136, it says, give thanks to the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Must be a pretty important thing for you and I to know and understand. So let's ask this question this morning. Who needs mercy? Who needs, you don't have, well, you, thank you for raising your hand. I wasn't going to ask you to. I'm right there with you, Dr. D. Who needs mercy? Number one, those who have sinned and messed up need mercy. David one day wasn't where he was supposed to be. The scripture says in the spring, when kings went out to war, David sent his army and he stayed in the palace. Happened to see a very beautiful woman on another rooftop bathing. He began to lust after her. 
found out who she was, committed adultery with her, and then conspired to commit murder of her husband. And when the prophet confronted him, David wrote Psalm 51. Hear these words. Listen to it very carefully. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. David wanted mercy. David needed mercy, and mercy is what he got. If you need mercy today, ask, and you'll receive. I know there are people in this room, people online, they say, well, I've never committed adultery. I've never conspired to commit murder and have someone killed. I don't do those things. Kind of reminds me of an old Oklahoma expression. We don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run with girls who do. See, that's sometimes the attitude of the church. I don't do those sinful things. Matter of fact, I come to church every time the doors are open. I pay my tithe. I give my offerings. I serve the church. But the question is, is that enough? The answer is no. Because we need mercy. We need mercy. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Who was John writing to? He was writing to the church. So it applies to us. We should bring our lives under God's searchlight so He can examine us and then we can find what place where we need mercy and He shows it to us. So this morning when I say God is a merciful God, I'm saying God is a forgiving God. He doesn't find it difficult to forgive. God doesn't just give us one more chance. He gives us as many chances as we need. Again and again and again and again. What did Peter say to Jesus? How many times a day should I forgive my brother who offends me? Seven times? What did Jesus say? No, not seven times. Seven times seven is what you should do. Seven times 70 is what you should do. It's amazing when you read that scripture. And if God applies that to our relationships, how much more does it apply to our relationship with him? The mercy is willing to forgive us. God, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, is rich in mercy. He is generous and liberal with His forgiveness. So there is someone in this room or someone online who said, No, I'm too far gone. It's impossible. I have too many bad things. I've come to tell you that's not true. That's a lie of the devil. And all you have to do is reach out to Jesus and cry out for His mercy. And right where you're at, right where you sit, He will forgive you. He will restore you. He will renew you. He will transform you. Matter of fact, He will make you a child of God. All you have to do is believe to receive. When we say God is merciful... We're saying God doesn't deal with us according to our sins. That's what Psalm 103 verse 10 says. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to His iniquities. Verse 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy to those who fear Him. I read that scripture and something begins rolling around in my mind and then I realize if I fear God, if I love God, if I reference God, there is a greater measure of mercy already stored up for me. Did you read it again? Great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. It's an amazing thing. When I read that, you know what it tells me? It tells me God's slow to anger. He puts up with our failures. He isn't quick to punish us. His mercy makes him exercise restraint when dealing with you and me. Why do I say that? Because the scripture says God is a consuming fire. The scripture says God is holy and you must be holy to come to his presence. The scripture says God is a fierce lion. Think about all those references. It's his mercy that keeps him from tearing us to pieces when we sin against him. 
When we say God is merciful, we're saying God abounds in love and is good to all. Even those who don't know him or don't care about him, he is merciful to them. God's mercy is extended. His love covers everyone. Regardless of age, regardless of skin color, regardless of where you grew up, regardless of the culture you're in, regardless of your education or lack thereof, regardless of your money or how poor you may be, God is merciful to everyone. Psalm 145.9 says, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all His works. So God's mercy is for those who have sinned and messed up. Number two, God's mercy... Is for those who are going through tough, difficult times. Some of you are in this room this morning. You're fighting the battle of your life. Some of you online would say to me, Steve, you don't know how rough it is. You don't know how tough it is. You don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. And I would say to you, God is merciful. And through his mercy, He'll meet you at your point of need. Isn't that what Hebrews 4, 16 says? Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain or receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So you need to quit being so shy. I'm here to tell you that when I had the accident, or I'm not talking about it yet, we will in a second. The guy who stopped beside me in the road, and I don't remember how this happened. I have an idea, but I don't remember. Called my wife. Told her I had an accident. She immediately texted four or five women. Immediately, an email went out. Sadie sent one out to the whole church. And within minutes, people around the world were praying for me. God's mercy was extended. You know, when I think about God's mercy, I want you to know He can turn your situation around. Think of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. She was childless. She was barren. The Bible said she'd go to the temple every year, and she would pray for a child. Year after year after year, and finally the high priest Eli saw her and told her that God would grant a request, and Within the years, she had a little boy by the name of Samuel. We know the rest of the story. God changed her circumstances, turned them completely around, took her from being childless to being the mother of one of the mightiest prophets of the Old Testament. God, by His mercy, can visit you just like He did Sarah, the wife of Abraham. She too was barren, had no children, couldn't have children. Years went by from the promise that you would be the father of many nations, 25 years to be exactly. But one day she conceived and she brought forth a son. His name was Isaac. He did become the father of many, many nations around the world. God's promise came true. He changed her circumstances So much so, those who laughed at her and ridiculed her because she was childless then began to come and laugh with her and rejoice with her over the blessing that God had given her through His mercy. So God's mercy is for those who are going through tough and difficult times. Number three, God's mercy is for those of of us who are facing satanic attacks and opposition. You know the problem in the church? We, i got to be careful how I phrase this so it's not misunderstood. We do live in victory. We do serve Jesus. We are more than conquerors. But every one of those verses imply there is someone fighting against us. There is a battle raging. There is an enemy in front of us. You see, so many times all we do is focus on the victory that we forget we got to fight. We got to pick up the sword and go to war and win the battles. It's time to stop standing on the sidelines, moaning about your circumstances because Satan is oppressing you. He's attacking you. It's time to stand up on your hind legs and say, I've got news for you, devil. You are defeated. You are under my feet. You will not have your way with me. I am victorious through the power of the blood. Someone needs to do that right now. 
In your home, you need to stand up and do that right now. Mercy. We think about Job's life. God allowed Job to strike, uh, Satan to strike Job. He took his riches. He took his family. He took his health. But God wouldn't allow him to take his life. And in the moment in Job 2, when his wife came and said, why don't you just curse God and die? What did he say? Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. My faith resides in a living God. And I know that one day he went on to say, I will see my Redeemer and stand before him. It's amazing. When you're facing satanic attack or opposition, you need God's mercy. David in Psalm 59, 16, and 17 called upon God. He said, but I will sing of your power. I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. Listen to verse 17. To you, O strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. He wrote that psalm because God had given him victory over his enemies. Who's our enemy? It's old horns on his head. It's old slew foot. It's old the one that smells of brimstone and fire, which is going to be his eternal resting place. And somebody needs to tell him that. I'm going to heaven where you got kicked out. And you're going to hell where I will never be. So what makes you think you have authority over me? I'm a child of God. I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have a bloodline over my life, and you cannot touch it or cross it. When we're facing satanic attack and opposition, October the 27th, about 11 o'clock in the morning, I finished these notes for this message. Sent a quick email to the church. I included a song that we're going to use and encourage you to begin praying for the service on October 30th. And as I left the building that day about 1130, I kept thinking over and over in my mind, I've got to find a good illustration about God's mercy. I'd ran through every story I'd ever heard, searched the internet. I couldn't find anything that really fit the bill. So I walked out of the building. I got on the Harley. And for some reason, really, I don't know, probably because it was still chilly that morning, I put my helmet on. And those of you in this house, you know that there was a lot of times, probably more than I did wear it, I didn't wear it. I'll never forget the text Miss Mary sent me a few years ago. She saw me going down the road without a helmet, and she sent me the text, please wear a helmet. I know you're a good rider. I don't worry about you. It's the other people I worry about. Please wear a helmet. At least make the undertaker's job a lot easier. I love that. I love that. Just exit and visit a friend. I got on I-10, I went all the way down the ramp. Traffic in the right lane was a little slow. I didn't know why. I was up to highway speed, and for me, that's 80. When I quickly moved into the center lane. And as soon as I moved into the center lane, there was a ladder, an extension ladder, completely across that lane. I couldn't go to my right, there was a car there. I couldn't go to my left, there was a car there. I didn't have time to brake or stop. So I did what anyone who rides a Harley does. You just hold the throttle and ride through it, hoping you can stay up and be all right. You don't hit the brake. You don't clutch. You keep the throttle on so you have power to that rear tire because that's what keeps you upright. And I remember hitting that ladder. Both of my tires popped. They didn't blow out. It broke the bead away from the rim, and they both lost all the air. When that occurred, I went into a high-speed wobble. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it, or Google Harley Death Wobble. There's all kinds of videos. I found one. I showed it to Yvonne, and 
we both decided we didn't want to show it today. It made me sick just to watch it. Went into a death wall. But when that happens, you cannot control the motorcycle. If you have time and space, you can slowly slow down and get it back under control. But again, I had neither time or space. Cars on each side of me. And when I realized I couldn't control the bike, I looked at the direction it was going. It was going directly toward that concrete barrier that separates the east and the westbound lanes of I-10. Someone said to me, well, did you pray? No, I didn't. Did you say Jesus? No, I didn't. You know what I thought? I thought, I'm going to hit that wall and this is going to hurt. I knew I was going to go down. You see, when you're prayed up, when you're full of the Holy Ghost, when you're walking with the Master, He's got you. If you have time to say, help me, He will. If you don't, He will anyway. You see, it's, mercy is not based on what you say to Him. It's based on what He's done for you. It's walking in relationship with the Master and seeing what it can do in your life. In a split second, I realized, and it literally was a split second, that I was going to hit that wall. And I don't have a memory of hitting the wall because when I did it, it knocked me off the bike. Let me stop and say I'm thankful I was on a 1,100-pound Harley-Davidson because a smaller bike probably would have thrown me over the handlebars across the wall and into oncoming traffic of I-10 eastbound. The bike hit the wall. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And I don't know how it did this, but it went all the way back across all three lanes to the right shoulder and ran down the guardrail and never laid down. Amazing. I came off the bike when it hit the wall and slid across the shoulder, the left lane, and ended up in the middle lane of I-10. Sean Acre happened to be going by, and she saw me laying in the middle of that lane. She wasn't sure it was me, so she turned around to look at the motorcycle, and when she saw it, there was no doubt in her mind, it was me. I remember coming to consciousness laying, and I didn't know where I was. And there was a guy kneeling beside me. Turns out he was the first car behind me. When he saw what was happening, he shut his car down and ran to me. An amazing thing happened. This little iPhone was in my back pocket, and it survived that crash. Now, the case it was in didn't survive, but the phone did. And I must have told him, unlock it, told him how to do that, and told him to call my wife, because he called her. And within minutes of the accident, there were people around the world praying for me. She notified everyone she could, and they notified everyone they could. I was laying on the ground, and my chest hurt crazy. My right leg in the thigh was... So, so painful. I heard everywhere. The first miracle I want to talk to you about is the fact that I'm alive. Because today, without the mercy of God, I would be in Rose Hill Cemetery in Oklahoma City. It's an amazing thing. One of the people that Yvonne texted was Alyssa Bedford. Jarvis, her husband, a battalion chief of the fire department, was working that day. She called him and said, Pastor's had a wreck. And this is from Jarvis. He said, I told her, I'll call you right back. He had heard the wreck on the radio, had no idea who it was. So he called the guys at the scene, and they, he said, was it a Harley in that wreck? And they said, yes, it was. It was orange. When he heard that, he told me his heart fell. He told me he went to a very, very bad place because he's worked I-10 and those accidents for years, and Jarvis said no one ever survives. 
when they hit the pavement, either they break their neck or they're ran over. Didn't see one survivor in all of his time from a high-speed motorcycle crash. And then just yesterday, I ran into Jennifer Johnson at Esposito's. And she was telling me that that day, she works in a surgical team. They were getting ready to leave and go home. And they got the message, you can't leave. We have a trauma victim coming in. And that was me. They expected to do surgery. Yesterday, I went to Walmart, which I hate going to Walmart, just so you know. I pray for you people that work there every day, that God will deliver you. I went to Walmart, and as I was going in, I was stopped in the parking lot by a couple of individuals. One was a retired nurse who had spent her career in the ER. When she heard my story, she said, we have a name for people like you in the ER. I said, yeah, what's that? She said, it's donor. Because all we can do is harvest the organs. No one ever lives. It's amazing. I went to the Harley dealer last week. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. I don't remember which. The insurance company had sent me an estimate on my bike wanting to repair it, and I knew it was wrong, so I went out there to talk to them. Found the general manager. I didn't realize that's who he was. I'd never met him before. And he's looking at the estimate I had handed to him, and when he read 2012 Harley-Davidson CVO, orange and black, he said, that's you? I said, yeah, that's me. He said, me and the sales manager, and he went in to get the sales manager, told him this is the guy that had that wreck. Me and the sales manager were a few cars behind you. We didn't see it happen, but we saw you laying on the highway, and we both said, he's dead. The mercy of God. The mercy of God. And I want to thank you right now, those of you, and I want you to stand when I make this statement, who came to the ER on October 27th to be with Yvonne. If you were there, would you stand across this room? Don't be shy. Stand up. Come on, there's others I know. Because I saw Sadie Marrero. I saw Melissa Kugel. I saw Sean Acri. One more, Yvonne, help me out. Anyway, there were four ladies that after three hours came back to see me and check on me. Thank you to each one of you who came to the yard to support Yvonne. Very difficult time for her. A lot of unknown things happening and occurring. Matter of fact, she told me when The guy called me and said, you had an accident. He told me you were okay in talking, but I know a lot of things happen in a motorcycle accident that are not visible. So the first miracle is I'm alive. Because everybody who's talked to me said, you don't survive a high-speed motorcycle crash on the interstate. Either you break your neck when you hit the pavement, or you get ran over by the cars behind you. But for the mercy of God. But for the mercy of God. Miracle number two that occurred. I got into, oh, I left one thing out. I've got to tell you, this is precious. When they were wheeling me into the ER, I was conscious. I was talking to the paramedics, the EMTs. And I heard a voice. And the voice said, that's my pastor. And I said, Jarvis, is that you? He said, in that moment, he knew I was going to be okay. But he was there for me. Just knowing that he was there brought such encouragement to me. May I tell you, you can never understand the value of your physical presence to someone who's facing trauma. Be there for them. You're really not too busy. You're really not too important. Be there for them. Help them, support them, encourage them. 
So the second miracle occurred when they gave me enough pain medicine that I could stand a CAT scan. And after that came back, the trauma doc came in and he said, the good news is your brain is okay. Well, that's encouraging. My brain's okay. But he went on to say, but you have a lot of broken bones. You're going to have to have a lot of surgeries to repair them. And your, your recovery is going to be long and slow. I do not doubt what he said. Because from his medical experience and expertise, he was making a correct statement. But what I know is the mercy of God. Four weeks to the day, I'm standing before you declaring, I serve a merciful God. A merciful God. He said, you have eight broken bones. There's a total of 13 breaks in those eight bones. One of your ribs punctured your lung. But for the mercy of God. But for the mercy of God. Last week I stopped by my friend's office, Dr. Finn. I hadn't talked to him for a while. He looked at my arm and he said, man, you must have good blood. And then he paused and said, or it's divine. I said, we'll talk about the power of the blood, and it's all God, it's not me. Someone said to me, you must be really tough. I'm not tough. I live in the mercy of God. No surgeries were required. After he said, you're going to have many surgeries and a long, slow recovery. And I'm here to tell you, four weeks later, I'm not 100%. But I'm getting there. And it's not going to take months for me to recover. I will be at 100% in a very short time because of the mercies of God. The third miracle that happened, I mentioned it earlier. I was laying on the pavement. And my right thigh, right here, was just, uh, it was extreme pain. And I've had broken bones, quite a few of them, and I knew that leg was broken. There was no doubt in my mind. When they got me in the ambulance, I said to the EMT that was taking care of me, I think my right leg is broken. He said, yeah, no doubt it is. When they rolled me into the trauma unit, I said to the trauma doctor, I think my right leg is broken. And he said, oh, yeah, it's broken. Dr. Nick Kacharis, maybe of you, you don't know him, he and his wife Juliana, both doctors, he was at the hospital that day. Matter of fact, they just had a brand new baby on Wednesday. Her name is Emma Jean, and they're a part of this church. Come on, give them a hand. I know they're watching this morning. Congratulations, Nick and Juliana. We love you and we're praying for you. He got word that I was in the accident in the trauma unit, and he came. He said, when I walked in, I saw your right leg, and your ankle was at an extreme angle, and it looked like the leg had been pulled back and then pulled back, pushed back up and shortened. He said, I knew it was broken, no doubt about it. So two doctors, one MT and me, were certain I had a broken right leg. No doubt about it. It was broken. But when Nick first came in, i, I got to tell you this part of the story. They read the CAT scan, and when he saw it, he said to the trauma doc, his lung has collapsed, been punctured. So they had to put it in a chest tube. And anyone who's had open heart surgery knows what a chest tube is all about. Matter of fact, the ICU nurse told me it's the most painful part of that surgery. Well, I didn't know what it was about. I had no idea. The doctor said to me, we can either give you a local and put it in, or we can put you out. And I'm thinking, I'm in so much pain right now, it's not going to matter. Just go ahead and put it in. What he didn't tell me is the local just dead in the skin where they made the incision. It's about that long. And my good buddy, Nick, and I'm talking to him right now, and I've told him this already, who was in the ER said, Pastor, do you want me to put that in for you? And I'm thinking, a guy I don't know and a guy I know. I'm going to go with the guy I know because he cares more about me. He'll be... He'll do it right. I said, sure, Nick, go ahead. So he made the incision. 
And then he said, and I quote, this is going to hurt a little. Understatement of the century. He shoved that chest tube in for a little ways and stopped, and with that I came clear off the table. The pain was so intense. When I laid back down, he said, i got to go a little further. And it felt like he went from here to here with that chest tube. It was searing, intense, hot pain. And the miracle is, I still love you, Nick. <laughs> but you're never putting a chest tube in me again. It was amazing. So after all this was done, they finally brought in the orthopedic surgeon. It's about an hour and a half later, two hours later, if I'd been there. And he says, well, you've got some broken bones that show on the CAT scan. And I said to him, Doc, my right leg is broken. He said, well, let's x-ray it. Let's see what we got. Did the x-rays. He came back a few minutes later. He had a slight smile on his face, and he said, that leg's not broken. It's perfectly fine. Someone said to me, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. When I was in that ambulance, when I was laying in that trauma bay, I was thinking, God, if my right leg is broken, I can't use crutches because my shoulder's messed up, my chest is messed up. I can't use a walker. I can't put any weight on it. I have to be in the wheelchair, and I don't want to be in a wheelchair and be a greater burden to my wife. So, God, would you help me? I'm here to tell you that between the time I had the accident and the time they took the x-rays, which may have been two and a half hours, God took that bone and put it back together. <laughs> Remember, two doctors, one EMT, all saying, yes, your leg is broken. Based on their experience and medical expertise, they knew they were right. I knew they were right, but I knew I had a merciful God. We serve a God who is rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Fourth miracle. You ready with those slides? It was the road rash I had. I had severe road rash on my nose, my face, my chin, both arms, elbows, shoulder, knees, ankles. That's what I looked like when they brought me into the ER. It was horrible. It's what my wife saw when she walked in. It was horrible. But God did an amazing thing. I told you what Dr. Finn said. You must have good blood. No, I've got the blood of Jesus Christ covering me. That's another shot of what I looked like in the ER. I asked Yvonne to take these pictures because I wanted to remember what I had endured. But after five days, show that next picture, Jada. After five days, still in the hospital, I was mending, I was healing. But you can still see that huge sore on my nose and on my chin. You can't see the, right, uh, the left cheek, but it was severely cut up as well. Going to day six, this is the day I went home from the hospital. And the road rash is healing, far from gone. Going to the next slide, but after two weeks, there was not a mark on my face. There is not today. I had a deep cut on the bridge of my nose. Those that you came to the hospital can tell you, I'm not exaggerating. I'm making it up. Matter of fact, Mark Milligan came to the house after I'd been released a couple days, and he said, I can't believe it. What you looked like then and what you look like now is nothing but a miracle. I have one little spot left on my elbow. That was the deepest of the road rash. And it's almost gone as well. It's an amazing thing what God can do when we declare, I live in the mercy of God. This is nothing short of miraculous. It should have taken a month or two months for all that road rash to heal. I should have scars on my face. I wasn't worried about scars on my face. I didn't ask him to make sure I didn't have scars on my face. It was just a gift of his mercy. He chose to do that for his son. The fifth miracle, when Yvonne and those ladies came in to the ER that day, 
First, she was glad I was alive, and she kissed me on the forehead. But then she said, no more motorcycles. You know, at that point, I agreed with her completely. But I'd been home from the hospital for, what, almost two weeks probably, and one day she took the dog for a walk. And as she was walking, the Holy Spirit said to her, is that your decision or is it mine? She said, well, I guess it's my decision. And then he said to her, as long as he's doing what I want him to do, I will cover him. And at that point, she released that anxiety and that worry and fear over what might happen in the future and put it in the hands of God. Now, let me tell you, a lot of people ask me why you ride a motorcycle. Yeah, I do like it. Yes, I do enjoy it. It is a lot of fun. But that's not why I ride a motorcycle. We ride a motorcycle because it opens a door for ministry. We've been able to do Run for the Wall and minister to veterans from California to Washington, D.C. That big old Hoka Hay emblem that I have on that motorcycle opens doors of conversation that lets me talk to people about how good God is and what God can do in their lives. Matter of fact, when the sales manager and junior manager got back to Harley, they were talking about the wreck and then describing the bike. And one of the guys, his name is Jamie, said, I know who that was. That's a local pastor. He's in here all the time. We work on his bike. And I'm sorry he's dead because they said he was dead. When I walked in there alive, Jamie was surprised as well. <laughs> surprised as well. Couldn't believe it. How is it possible you should be dead? Oh, let me finish this. I don't know what we're going to do in the future about a bike, but I know if there's a door of opportunity to continue ministry and touch hearts and lives, God will cover us. That much I know. The other thing I didn't tell you is when I was going towards that wall, knowing I was going to hit it and go down, there was no fear whatsoever. None. Just a perfect sense of peace. I knew it was going to hurt. I knew it was going to be injured. But there was no fear. See, when you're living in the mercy of God, He removes the fear of the circumstance and covers you in His peace. Within minutes of that wreck, people around the world were praying for me. Every visitor that came to the hospital, I said, would you please pray for me? How did the road rash heal so quickly? Because people prayed for me. Because I asked them to pray for me. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you need to quit hiding your pain and hiding your circumstance and hiding your illness and disease and bring it out so somebody can pray for you. There is power in prayer. Job 42.10 says, And when he prayed for his friends, he was healed. We need people praying for us. Reminding us we serve a great God, a merciful God. So I'm here to declare to you the words of Joseph from generation cha Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. What you, and I'm applying this to the enemy, Satan, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Because I am convinced this testimony will turn men to Christ, will cause them to look to Him, will help them to recognize there is help from the Lord. Yes. Told you so many times the miracle of Gary and Carolyn's wreck last summer. I tried to lift that motorcycle off of Carolyn's legs and I couldn't do it. And I don't know if I said it out loud or, or just thought it in my mind, Lord, I need help. I turned around to talk to someone else who had came in through the trees and all the dead limbs and broken branches. He was there at Carolyn's head talking to her. When I turned back around, there was this huge guy standing on my right, arms like this. And he said these words, what do you need? I said, I need that motorcycle lifted off of her legs. I didn't hear him come in through those broken branches and leaves and all the trees. Heard the other guy, but not him. 
He lifted that off of her like it was a piece of paper. I pulled her legs out, turned around to see if that was helping her pain. And when I turned back, he was gone. And I didn't hear him leave through the trees, through the branches, through the dead leaves. No noise whatsoever. Someone said, well, who was that? Let me tell you. It was an angel of God bringing the mercies of God to me and carrying Carolyn and Gary Bird when we couldn't do it ourselves. Mercies of God. You know, we're experiencing a mighty move of God in this church. Have been since the middle of September. Holy Spirit is real. And last week, Pastor Terrell Todd made this statement. When Satan wants to attack a church, he attacks its leader. I want you to understand, this was nothing but a frontal assault from the gates of hell. But I also want you to understand, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Romans 14, 17, but the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. He took his best shot. And you know what I have to say to him this morning? I'm back. Because of the mercy of God. I want to make it very clear. It has nothing to do with my stubbornness, determination, toughness. It has to do with the mercy of God. Plain and simple. Being stubborn, determined, or tough doesn't make you heal the way I have healed. The blood of Jesus does. I'm standing here today because of the mercy of God. I should be in Rose Hill Cemetery in Oklahoma City. Tom, would you come back? I should be six feet beneath the earth. My wife should be a widow. My kids should be fatherless. My grandkids should no longer have pops. But for the mercy of of God. And then these scriptures began running through, running through my mind the last few days. Paul said in Acts 20, 24, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry entrusted by Jesus Christ. I've come to tell you today, it hasn't moved my resolve, my vision, my determination, my call. None of these things move me. Romans 8.18, Paul wrote, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For I light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I've come to tell you today, the mercy of God triumphs over the works of the devil every single time. Slewfoot is defeated. He's under our feet. God will not let your enemies triumph over you. Because of the mercy of God, he will help you. He will defend you. He will come to your aid and come to your side when you can do nothing yourself. And he will destroy and break apart the attack of the enemy. I believe the mercy of God will break and scatter and destroy every evil chain, every yoke holding your life, your family, your destiny down. It's the mercy of God. I believe the mercy of God will help you resist every opposition and obstacle to receiving God's mercy. You remember the Canaanite woman who came to us? He wanted, she wanted Jesus to heal her daughter. He sent her away, said, we're not giving you help because of who you are. He wasn't being mean, he was testing her faith. She came back and said, but master, even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. And with that statement, he healed her daughter. You see, she needed mercy. She wanted mercy. She came for mercy. And mercy is what she got. 
Mark chapter 10, it tells the story of a blind man sitting outside the city of Jericho as Jesus was coming down the road. And to really understand this, you have to probably read the book of Mark and understand that everywhere he went, huge crowds followed him. The blind man couldn't see what was going on, but he knew a commotion. He could hear the noise of the crowd. He said to someone, what's going on? And the man said to him, someone said to him, it's Jesus coming this way. And that old blind man began to yell, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those around him said, be quiet, shut up, don't be so loud. But he yelled even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So much so that Jesus heard him. He stopped. He said, what do you need? And he made him whole in that moment of time. He needed mercy. He wanted mercy. And mercy is what he got. To receive God's mercy, we have to throw off every garment of pretense, every garment of faulty thinking, every garment that says we don't deserve it, we're not qualified. You see, mercy has nothing to do with your bank account, how much you earn or where you live or what people think, how horrible our sins are, how big our problems are. But mercy has everything to do with God and us approaching Him in humility and asking Him to show us mercy. Elders and deacons, would you stand and come at this time? See, God issues an invitation to each one of us, and that invitation is to draw near to the throne of grace, to find mercy and help in times of need. To come with confidence to the place where God meets us in Christ. Haley's coming. I want you to listen to the words of the song she's about to sing. It's called Mercy Seat. I'm not going to tell you what to do. The Holy Ghost is going to tell you what to do. But as she sings and the words of this song begin to resonate, just follow him. Some of you are going to run to this altar. Some of you are going to come and say, I need mercy. So I ask you today, just follow Holy Spirit. And when everyone has responded and the song is over, I'm going to grab a bottle of oil and I'm going to come down and anoint each and every one of you. We're going to pray the prayer of faith over you and it will raise and save the sick and bring transformation to the lost. So when you come, tell these elders and deacons what you need prayer for so they can pray specifically. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 10.30 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.